بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا يا شهيد يا مظلوم يا غريب كربلا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما Enlighten your hearts and majalis with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. <laughs> Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The belief in Al Mahdi is a common and fundamental belief between all Muslims. Every Muslim irrespective of their school of thought, whether they are Shia, whether they are Sunni, whether they are from any other school of thought, they all believe in the Mahdi, the awaited Savior, that towards the end of time he will rise and he will fill the world with justice, eradicate all evil, all oppression from the dunya, and establish the just government of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim believes in this. Now many people, many Muslims, they incorrectly think that Al-Mahdi is only a belief of the Shia. Many Shia, many of us, many Shia believe that Al-Mahdi is only for the Shia, that other Muslims don't believe in Al-Mahdi. But when you go to the school of thought of the Sunnis, for example, the Sunni school of thought, you find that they likewise believe in the Mahdi. Go to the book of Bukhari, you'll find many ahadith speaking about the Mahdi. Go to the book of Muslim, many ahadith about the Mahdi. And I read some of those ahadith, you would be surprised how much there is in their books. For example, one hadith that you find in their books, and in many of their books, the Prophet says, Al-Mahdi yuminna ahl al-bayt. Another hadith you find in their books, Rasulullah says, Al-Mahdi yumin wuldi Fatima. That the Mahdi is from the lineage and progeny, of my daughter Fatima. This is all in their books, not just in the Shia books. And there are many ahadith that speak about the signs of the reappearance. Before the Imam comes, what will happen? Many ahadith about the personality of Imam Mahdi, the characteristics and the traits of the Imam. When he appears, what will happen? When he appears, who are the evil people? Who are the good people? The Dajjal. So many ahadith they have about the Dajjal and what will happen? So the problem is many people think it's only restricted, the Mahdi, it's restricted to Shia and it's, re it's limited only to the Shia school of thought. I remember once I was watching a Q&A show of one of those Wahhabi leaders, scholars in Saudi Arabia. And he had a Q&A session I was watching on the TV. So one person asked him this question. He said, what do you say about those people that deny the Mahdi? They say this Mahdi is a myth. What do you say about those people? And this was one of the large Wahhabi scholars of Saudi Arabia. He said, I saw it on TV, he said, I say about these individuals that deny the Mahdi one of two things. Either they are ignorant, they don't know what they're talking about, they haven't read the books, or they are evil, they have agendas, they have sinister motives behind denying the Mahdi. And then he said, the Mahdi, there is consensus, all the ulama, all the schools of thought, they believe that the Mahdi will come and he will rule the world with justice. But however, the only difference between what we believe and what other Muslims believe is this point. We say that he was born, he was the son of an Imam al-Askari, and he was born almost a thousand years ago, while most other Muslims believe that he has not yet been born. This is the only difference. But all the other major tenets of this belief, we agree upon. 
They believe that he will be born before he rises and fills the world with justice. And because of this small, and I stress the word small, discrepancy, difference between what we believe and what other Muslims believe, you find many people have mocked the Shia. They say, you believe in an imam that is over 1,000 years old? Isn't this a myth? To me, this sounds like a fairy tale. This is what they say. To me, this sounds like one of those Hollywood movies. But I don't think so that there is a man, there is an imam that's over a thousand years ago. Where is he? How come we can't see him? How is he an imam? And many times we were asked by some Muslims that, how do you believe in this Mahdi? This is a myth. This doesn't make sense. This is a fairy tale. Do we have the answer? If someone comes to me and says, how is he live a thousand years? Where is your Mahdi? How do you benefit from him? Do I have an answer or not? Because remember, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says this, مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَّةً The Prophet is narrated saying in an authentic sahih that all Muslims narrate. This is not a Shia hadith. It's a hadith that all books narrate. The Prophet says whoever dies not knowing, not having ma'rifah of the imam of his time, that person dies a death of ignorance, jahiliya, meaning his iman is incomplete. In another hadith I read, that Imam al-Sadiq, he spoke to one of his companions about Imam al-Mahdi. He tells Zurara, he told him that the Mahdi, one of my grandchildren, he will go into the ghaybah, the occultation. And then he tells Zurara, he tells him, if you lived up to that day, the day of the ghaybah, like today. Now Zurara didn't, but Zurara, he was a narrator, so he would narrate this hadith to the generations. He said, if you lived up to the day where the Mahdi went into the ghaybah, Remember to always read this dua. And then Imam al-Sadiq said this dua. Allahumma arrifni nafsak. Fa'annaka in arraftani nafsak. Fa'annaka in lam tu'arrifni nafsak. Lam a'rif nabiyak. Oh Allah, allow me to know you. Have ma'rifah of you. Because if I have no ma'rifah of Allah, I will not know Rasulullah. I will not know the Messenger of God. Correct? If I don't know Allah, I'll know Rasulullah. And then the Imam said, say this, Allahumma arrifni rasulak, fa'annaka in lam tu'arrifni rasulak, lam a'rif hujjatak. Oh Allah, give me ma'rifah of Rasulullah. Because if I have no ma'rifah of Rasulullah, then I will not know the Imams. I will not know the successors of Rasulullah, which are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And then this is what the Imam said, and this is what I'm trying to reach. The Imam said the final Point, the final part of the dua is this Allahumma arrifni hujjatak fa'innaka in lam tu'arrifni hujjatak walaltu andini. Ya Allah, give me the ma'rifah of the Imam, the hujjah of my time, God's representative during my life. Because if I don't know the Imam of my time, walaltu andini, I have gone astray. My Iman is incomplete. There's a problem in my religion. And that's why you find. That the belief in Al-Mahdi, my friends, and the Ma'rifah in Al-Mahdi is very important. Ma'rifah. You see in the hadith of the Prophet, he says, Man mata wa lam ya'rif. Ya'rif is from Ma'rifah. In this hadith, arrifni hujjatak. What is Ma'rifah? Many of us, we think Ma'rifah, knowledge, is, I know that his name is Mahdi. He is the son of Al-Askari. He is in Ghaybah now, and he will come one day, and he'll fill the world with justice. Is this Ma'rifah? This is a ma'rifah. Ma'rifah means I have to know more than that about al-Mahdi. I have to at least know how to answer these accusations, these shubahat, these misconceptions. When I am asked, how does he live such a long life? Where is the Mahdi now? Why is he in hiding? How do I benefit from the Mahdi? Every Shia needs to know this. Everyone. He's my imam. How do I benefit from him if he's my imam? Or else he's not my imam if there's no benefit. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we have to have this education about the Mahdi, the imam of our time. And tonight, inshallah, in the few minutes that I have, I want to go over three points so that we may increase our knowledge about the imam of our time. Point number one, how does the imam have such a long life? Point number two, where is the imam? When we, see, when we say he's in ghaybah, what do we mean by that? Is the Imam hiding? And number three, how can we benefit from Al Imam Al Mahdi in Asr Al Ghaybah during his occultation? I will go over these three points, but first, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah. 
Point number one. How does the Imam live such a long life? Al Imam al Mahdi was born in the year 255 after Hijrah. This year, it's 1,441 in the Islamic calendar. So that makes the Imam's life 1,186 years in the Hijri years. So many times we're asked, and I may think, does this make sense? That I have an Imam that lives that long. And I've seen many times we're accused, we the Shia, you believe in a fairy tale, your Imam is that old. What do we say as a reply? Two points, brothers and sisters. Number one, if anyone tells you, how is your Imam 1,186 years old? You tell him, number one, naturally speaking, the average lifespan of a human being now is what? 70 years, let's say, 70, 75. But Al Imam Al Mahdi is not living such a long life naturally. No one's saying this is a natural phenomenon. What we are saying is that this is a miracle of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal is giving him such a long life and Allah can do anything, right? Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ If Allah wants something, He just says, كُنْ be. And it shall be. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of Al-Mahdi, it's not impossible for Allah. So this is point number one. This is a miracle of Allah when you're asked how. Number two, if they say, well, yes, Allah can do it, but Allah has never done it. Every human being, maximum they'll live 100, 110, maybe 120. What's a thousand years? Allah never does this type of miracle. This is only in Hollywood in the movies. What do you tell them? Tell them, no. Read your books. Let's go to the prophets of Allah. Begin with Prophet Nuh. How long did Prophet Nuh, Prophet Nuh live? The Quran says, this is the Quran. The Quran says that Prophet Nuh, he propagated and invited his people. He worked with his people for 950 years. Is this a myth? How can Nuh, that wasn't the life of Nuh. That was just the amount of years that he spent with his people. Is this a myth? You, a myth? you ask them how? They say this is a miracle, right? If Allah could do a miracle for Nuh, why not for Imam Mahdi? Why? Is this a double standard? And in our traditions, well, our hadith state that Prophet Nuh lived 2,500 years. If Prophet Nuh can live that long, Imam Mahdi's life is half of Prophet Nuh right now, isn't it? Nuh lived 2,500, Imam Mahdi is 1,186. It's half, less than half. That's number one. Number two, Muslims believe, all Muslims, Prophet Adam lived almost a thousand years. That's number two. Number three, a third example is Khidr. Khidr, who's mentioned in the Quran, and I'll get to that. Some believe he was a prophet. Some say no, he was a wise man that was given knowledge by Allah. Similar to Luqman, the same uh, issue, the same discussion revolves regarding Luqman. Was he a prophet? Was he not? But anyway, Al-Khidr, who was living during the time of Musa. Prophet Musa, when did he live? 3,000 years ago maybe? Khidr, according to all Muslims. All Muslims, this is not a Shia belief. Khidr is alive till today. They say, go ask any Muslim from any school of thought, they will tell you that Khidr is alive today. Maybe he's 3,000, 4,000 years old. So how can Khidr live and Imam Mahdi can't live that long? And subhanAllah, there's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq. The Imam says the reason why Allah allowed Khidr to live such a long life, so you can use his long life to prove that Mahdi could also live a long life. Anytime they say, what is this? Qurafa, what is this myth that Mahdi lives a thousand years? You tell them, Khidr, you believe he's alive, correct? That's number three. Number four, you have Ilyas. Ilyas was a prophet that lived thousands of years ago. Muslims believe, not Shia. They believe that he's alive till this day. And I saw a hadith that they narrate. Listen, they narrate in their books that Ilyas and Khidr go to Hajj every year. They do Hajj together. And once they finish Hajj, each one shaves the head of the other. This is what they narrate in their hadith. And they are both thousands of years old. So how is that possible? They tell you it's a miracle. You tell them for Mahdi, it's a miracle too. So if we have so many prophets that live that long, why can't I believe in Mahdi, who is the representative of Allah, he can live so long? It's the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And interestingly, you know the Dajjal, the Dajjal, when you go to the Sunni books, there's many ahadith about Dajjal. In our books, the Shia books, there isn't too much. Few hadiths about Dajjal. But what we believe is Dajjal, if he's a true person, because some scholars say Dajjal isn't even a person. When we read about Dajjal, the evil Dajjal, the one-eyed Dajjal, some scholars believe it's a system. 
It's an evil system. It's not a person. Other scholars believe, no, it's a person who's Dajjal. They say Dajjal, he will be born whenever he rises. But do you know that most Muslims believe that Dajjal was born even before Rasulullah? And that during the life of Rasulullah, until now, Dajjal is chained, he's chained and sh in shackles in an island somewhere. And he's alive. So based on those hadith, he's at least 1400 years old. For Dajjal, it's okay, it's not a myth. But for Mahdi, all of a sudden, it's a myth. So this is obviously double standard. It's a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is point number one. How does the Mahdi live so long? It's a miracle of Allah. Allah did it many times with many other prophets. Point number two. When we say Al Imam al Mahdi is in Ghayba, Ghayba, occultation, what does that mean? Most of us don't know. Most Shia, they don't know, especially our youth. What does it mean when they hear that our Imam is in Ghayba? You know what most people think? They think the Imam is isolated somewhere far by himself, completely disconnected from the world. Sometimes I hear people say the Imam is living on an island somewhere. Some say Bermuda. Now where did that come from? I have no idea. No idea. There is nothing in the ahadith that mentioned Bermuda. This is, uh, you know, from people's, uh, people's words. It's not from the ahadith. Other people, they say that, you know, this is we Shia, we've been accused of this, that the Mahdi is hiding in a basement in Samarra. Is this true? No. Where does this come from? You see, inshallah, if you have the honor to go and visit Samarra, many of you have. The place where Imam al-Askari is buried, this used to be the house of Imam al-Askari. His house had a basement. Imam al-Mahdi grew up there, right? Imam al-Mahdi grew up in that house. The house of Imam al-Askari had a basement. That's it. Did Imam al-Mahdi hide there? Is Imam al-Mahdi hiding there? No. That basement has nothing to do with the Imam. The Imam is not there. I've been to the basement. You can go. It's open. You won't find the Imam there. He's not sitting there. There isn't any hadith to suggest the Imam even goes there. Maybe he goes because it's the house of his father, but it's not anything, anywhere that he spends too much time in. So when we say the Imam is in Ghaybah, we, does, we don't mean that the Imam is somewhere all by himself in an island or in, in a basement somewhere. No! What do we mean by Ghaybah then? When we say the Imam is in Ghaybah, what do we mean by that? We mean one thing only. We mean that the Imam's identity is concealed. The Imam's identity is hidden. There's a difference you see between someone hiding and someone who's not hiding, but his identity is hidden. Maybe Imam al-Mahdi could be in our majlis, who knows? When you go to Karbala, maybe you run into Imam Mahdi, maybe you've seen him, he's not hiding, but you just don't know he's Mahdi. You don't know, you can't recognize him. And there's many ahadith about this. In one hadith, Imam al-Sadiq says that al-Mahdi, when he's in the ghaybah, don't think he's hiding. He walks in the streets, he walks in the shops, you may see him. The Imam even says this, that the Mahdi has 30 companions called the Abdal. The Imam says, وَمَا بِثَلَاثِينَ مِنْ وَحْشَ These companions, obviously, they don't live long lives like the Imam. So every generation, they change because they die. And the Imam has new companions. He's always surrounded by 30 companions that help him. Who are they? We don't know. His identity is concealed. In one of the Ahadith, the second, I believe, ambassador, he says, that the Mahdi goes to Hajj every single year. The Mahdi, he attends Hajj every year. And then he says, maybe you see him. You don't recognize him, but he knows it's you. Maybe all, some of us have seen Al-Mahdi, but we thought it was a, just a good, good man. It was a good man who had a you know, beautiful face, a face that had light. But I didn't know it's Mahdi. So this is what we mean by Ghaybah. When we mean ghaybah, we don't mean the imam is all by himself, somewhere disconnected. No, the imam is amongst us. He lives a normal life. The only thing is we don't know who the imam is. We don't know where he is. His identity has been concealed by Allah. Why? Why has his identity been concealed? Why doesn't he live like his fathers? I tell you why. How many imams do we have? Twelve, right? Twelve. Before him, there was 11 Imams. Did any of them die a natural death? Out of the 11 Imams, how many of them were killed? 11 out of 11. The hadith of the Imam says, مَا مِنَّا إِلَّا مَقْتُولٌ أَوْ مَسْمُومٌ 
He says, every one of us Imams, we were killed by the sword, like Imam Ali and Imam Hussein, or by poison, like all the other Imams, Imam Al- Imam Al Hassan, Imam Al Zayn Al Abidin, Imam Al Baqir, and, and all the other Imams. If Allah would not hide his identity, they would kill him just like his fathers. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala wants to preserve the last Imam because He wants him to fulfill a duty to establish justice in the world. So we ask, so why didn't he, why doesn't he already show? Why doesn't he you know rise now? Why one thousand one hundred eighty six years? This is our fault, brothers and sisters. I've read two hadiths, one from Imam al-Sadiq, one from Imam al-Jawad. They both emphasize that when the Imam, and I know you know this, when the Imam has the 313, he will appear. The Imam is waiting for us, subhanAllah. Many people ask me this, we have 200 million Shia today, but yet we don't have the 313. Why? Because the Imam is looking for special people. That doesn't mean that the Shia, there's no Mu'mineen. There's many Mu'mineen, many good people, but the Imam wants special people. Those Mu'mineen, those believers that have complete submission to the Imam and to Allah. Like Habib ibn Mudahir, like Muslim ibn Awsaja, where they stood. I, if you remember, I mentioned a few nights ago when Imam Hussein on the night of Ashura, he told them, leave me. I don't want you to be killed. What did, what did uh, Muslim bin Awsa just say? He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, if I were to be cut for you into pieces, if I were to be cut into pieces and then my body parts were to be burned and then that ash of my body would be dispersed in the air, if they do that to me 70 times, I will not leave you. How many of us can say that to Al Mahdi? I don't know if I can say that. Maybe once, maybe twice. I don't even know if once. Remember 18,000 people sent letters to Imam Hussein? How many of them showed up? Zero. MashaAllah, we know how to talk. But when it comes to actually performing, unfortunately, many of us fail. Many of us fail. Zuhair ibn al qayn he told Imam Hussein, if I die 1,000 times for you, wallahi, I would never stop. So the Imam is looking for those special ashab of his. During the time of Imam al-Sadiq, one of his companions by the name of Sadir or Sudair al-Sayrafi, he comes to him, he tells him, Oh Imam al-Sadiq, why don't you rise against the Zalameen, the unjust governments of Bani al-Abbas? The Imam says, because I have no supporters. How? Sadir tells him, you have no supporters. You have hundreds of thousands of Shia. He tells him, hundreds of thousands of Shia in al-Kufa and other places. And you say, I have no supporters. The Imam comes, he takes him outside of the house. They pray there. And then there were some goats there. The Imam told him, Wallahi ya Sadir, if I had as many supporters, true Shia, like the Shia of Hussein, like the companions of Hussein, if I had as many as these goats, I would never stay in my house. I would rise. So Dave says, I began to count the goats. You know how many goats there were? 17. And Imam al-Sadiq doesn't just want people who call themselves Shia. He wants those individuals that have complete submission to the Imam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid the identity of the Imam to protect him until he waits for the 313 or else they would go after the Imam and kill him just like all his other fathers. So this is number two. Now we understand what we mean by ghaybah, occultation. The Imam isn't hiding. The Imam is amongst us. Some of us have seen the Imam. Some of us, maybe we have even spoken to the Imam. But we don't know it's the Imam because Allah has to hide his identity in order to protect him. And finally, number three. How do we benefit from him? Many people ask, if I can't see him, if I can't ask him questions, if I cannot benefit from his ilm, from his knowledge, from his hikmah, from his wisdom, if I cannot pray behind him, if I can't access him, if I can't speak to him, if he's not here to unite us Shia, to lead us when we have problems, when we have tragedies, then what's the point of the Imam Mahdi? How is he even an Imam? How do we benefit from the Mahdi? And unfortunately, some of the, you know, some Muslims, they tell us, you believe in your Imam Mahdi, where is he? How come he doesn't come to save you? Your Mahdi has neglected you. He has left you. So how do we benefit from Al Mahdi, brothers and sisters? We have to strengthen our relationship with him. But first, we have to increase our knowledge. 
to answer this question, how we benefit from Al-Mahdi, brothers and sisters, I want to bring you to the Qur'an. The Qur'an tells us that it's possible for you, for a community, for a people, to benefit from a prophet or a messenger or a good man. It's possible for them to benefit from that individual while no one knows what he's doing. It's possible that a messenger, that a prophet, that an imam could help his people secretly. He could work undercover and no one could know. Why does Allah put these verses in the Quran? So that you know. If Allah gives us examples of people in the past that they secretly used to help prophets who secretly used to help their people, why can't Mahdi do the same? Secretly, why? Nobody knows what the Mahdi is doing, but he is helping us. Allah gives us the example of whom? <clears throat> Khidr, that I spoke about. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran that he ordered Prophet Musa and his successor, Yusha ibn Nun. He ordered them to go and visit Khidr to learn from him. Allahu Akbar. Allah orders Musa, Kalimullah. He tells him, go and benefit from him. The Holy Quran says, فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا Allah doesn't even say his name. He says, Abd. He's a servant of Allah. آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا We gave him rahmah, we gave him ilm, knowledge, wisdom. So Musa and his successor Yusha, they go to Khidr. They spend, I think, a few days with him. They spend some time with him. And then they just notice, what is this guy doing? And the Quran says that Khidr did three things. Number one, he helped those poor people that had a ship from that oppressive, that Zalim king. Number two, he saved the two parents from their ungrateful son. And number three, he saved and preserved the treasure of two yatims. Two orphans that had no one to look out for them. They had a treasure that was, you know, that was, uh, that nobody knew where it was, but he preserved it and saved it for them. He did these three good things in his community. He was helping them. But did anyone know what he was doing? Those people that owned the ship, they had no clue Khidr saved their ship. Those two parents, they had no clue what their Khidr did for them. And those two Yatims had no clue. Not just those people, even Musa. Even Prophet Musa had no clue what Khidr was doing. And that's why the Quran in Surah Al-Kaf tells us, he kept on objecting. What are you doing? Why did you do this to the ship? Why did you do this to this young man? Why did you bring down the wall? Even Musa had no clue what Khidr was doing. While Khidr was working undercover to help his people. What is the moral of the story? That it's possible that a messenger, a prophet, an imam could be helping his community, his people secretly while no one knows. If Khidr was able to help so many people, why can't Mahdi help us but secretly? Do I have to see it with my own eyes? How many times I'm sure you've been in an experience. How many stories you've heard of a random stranger that comes and just helps you. That comes and saves your, saves your life. In those desperate times they come and help you. How do you know Imam al-Mahdi didn't send that person? I have so many stories, wallahi, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends you while you don't even know. When people are conspiring against you, when they want to bring you down, there's mysterious people that are fighting for you and helping you. How do I know that Al-Mahdi had not sent those individuals? Do I know for sure? The point is I have to trust Al-Mahdi. The point is I know Al-Mahdi is working undercover to help all of us. Every single one of us. Subhanallah. And this is what the Mahdi himself says. Al-Imam Al-Mahdi in the beginning of Al-Ghayb Al-Kubra. Because remember, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi became Imam when he was five years old. And then there was the, the period of Al-Ghayb Al-Sughra for almost 65, 70 years. Ghayb Al-Sughra, meaning the Imam had some communication with the Shia, some limited. He had ambassadors that would directly deal with the Shia. But after that, in the year 329 after Hijrah or 330, after the fourth ambassador died of Imam al-Mahdi, the Imam said that I am going into the big ghaybah, the big occultation, al ghayb al-Kubra, meaning no one will get access to me now, knowing that I am the Mahdi. So when that happened, the Shia, after five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, they didn't hear anything from Imam al-Mahdi. They began to lose hope in him. Where is the Mahdi? He neglected us. He forgot about us. Did he die? Is he alive? And Imam al-Mahdi wrote a letter. Read that letter. It's beautiful. He wrote a letter and he sent it to a Shaykh al-Mufid. A Shaykh al-Mufid was one of our ulama maraja a thousand years ago in Baghdad. 
in Iraq. He sent a letter to Ash Shaykh Al Mufid, many beautiful things. Amongst the things that Imam Al Mahdi wrote in that letter to Ash Shaykh Al Mufid, he said this Inna, Inna, Nuhito Ilman bi Ambaikum, Wala Yazubu Anna Shayun min Akbarikum. These are the words of Imam Al Mahdi. I'm reading to you. He tells Al Mahdi, Tell my Shia that I know everything that happens to them, everything. Anything the Shia go through, my people, any tragedy, any problem, any stage they're going through, the Imam says, tell them, I know everything. Tell them, I, I'm not isolated from them. I'm not disconnected from them. I know everything. And then he says, Tell them, I have not forgotten my Shia. I have not neglected them. I'm doing many things for them. But I am doing it undercover. I'm doing it secretly while they don't know. And then listen to the words of the Imam. He says, Tell my Shia, if it wasn't for me and what I do, your enemies would have destroyed you, O Shia. We would have read, now 2019, we would have read in the books that there used to be a school of thought named at tashayyu the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. But because of how much they were killed and killed and killed, they did not remain. You know, we have schools of thought that got extinct. For example, we have the Fatahiyya. They stopped at Imam al-Sadiq and then they followed his son Abdullah al-Aftah. Are they, are they alive now? No, it's extinct. It's only in the books. We had another school of thought named Al-Waqifiyya. Waqifiyya, they believed up to the seventh Imam. Every Imam, you find, there were groups that said, you know what, we don't want the next Imam. All of them are extinct, or most of them. But look at the ones that follow Al-Mahdi. They believe in the twelfth Imams, the Shia of Imam Al-Mahdi. How did we make it for a thousand years? Every period you choose, brothers and sisters, we Shia, we were killed just for being Shia. I don't think there's any other religion, any other followers of a religion that were killed for over a thousand years just for being Shia. During the time of Amir al muminin what did Muawiyah do? He would go after every Shia and kill him. During the time of Hajjaj, this is during the time of Sayyid Imam Zain al-Abidin al-Baqir. They say that in the city of Al-Kufa under Al-Hajjaj during that time, if you were accused of being a Shia of Ahlul Bayt, it was worse than being accused of being an atheist. That's why we have the notion of what? Taqiyya. Why do we have Taqiyya? Because if it wasn't for Taqiyya, we had no Shia. You think we'd have this majlis of Imam Hussein today? All our great grandparents would have been killed and many of them were killed. It was because of the works of an Imam Al-Mahdi. He was privately during the ghaybah, the work of an Imam al-Mahdi, what he did, we don't know what he did. He doesn't tell us, but he just says, trust me, if it wasn't for me, he tells the Shaykh al-Mufid, tell my Shia, you Shia would have been annihilated. You know, we had times where they used to attack our libraries filled with Shia books. This is five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years ago, and they would burn all of them so that the Shia hadiths are all gone. We had maraja, maraja whose heads were chopped off. Shaheed al-Awwal, Shaheed al-Thani, we had in history. Maraji' who were killed. So many Shia were killed in Egypt. If you see one of the icons of the Muslim Ummah today is whom? They consider him a hero. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. They consider him a hero. And he's the one that conquered Egypt. When in the Fatim, in the Fatim, in the Fatimid dynasty. Where most of them were Shia. Or they were Ismaili, either way. Do you know what Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi did? Do you know why they consider him a, a hero? One of the heroic acts that he did is that he killed 100,000 Shi'as in, in Egypt. You won't see that in the, you know, in the public biography of uh, Salah al-Din because they hide that. He killed 100,000 Shi'as in Nusr. Every generation, look at now. Look what happened in Iraq and Syria. What ISIS did. How many Shia did they kill? Just because you're Shia. No other crime. Look at what they're doing every day in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon. So many countries. Just because you're Shia, you fear for your life. And this is what? This is the 21st century when you have human rights and you have TV and you have internet and you have social media. And they still go after the Shia to kill them. Imagine what happened a thousand, nine hundred, eight hundred years ago.
how is it that now, with all of this oppression towards the school of thought, you have 200 to 300 million Shia? How? Does it make sense? The more they kill us, the more we get. How? I tell you how. It's the work of an Imam al-Mahdi. Wallahi, it is the work of an Imam al-Mahdi that he kept his school of thought, that he kept this tashayyu alive. And he himself, he tells this to a Shaykh al-Mufid, if it wasn't for me, no, you Shia would have all been killed. There would be no Shia. Until this day, the Imam is supporting us. The Imam is working for us, but the Imam is doing it all undercover, behind the scenes. Because the work of the Imam is all behind the scenes. How do we benefit from the Imam? The least thing we benefit is that this beautiful school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, the word of Hussein, our love of Hussein is all due to him. If it wasn't for him, Wallahi, we would not know who Hussein is. We would never, none of us would come here to remember Abu Abdullah al Hussein. I want to tell you a story that happened 800 years ago in the country of Bahrain. 800 years ago, Bahrain had a king. And he had his uncle who was the prime minister. His uncle used to be a Nasibi, someone who hates the Shia, hates Ahlul Bayt. And he used to always, you know, encourage his, his, his nephew, the king, to oppress the Shia of Bahrain. SubhanAllah, just like today, you know, today, same thing. They say that the uncle of the king of Bahrain, he's a Nasibi, and he's the one behind all of the oppression of the Shia. So anyway, this uncle of the king in Bahrain 800 years ago, and Bahrain was all Shia, mostly Shia, he hated the Shia. He, all, he was always trying to get rid of them, the ones that lived in Bahrain. So one day, he got a very evil plan. He prepared a very evil plan. He came to his nephew, the king, and he brought with him a pomegranate, rumman, anar. You know the fruit, the anar, the pomegranate? He brought it to him and he ran to him. He told him, your majesty, your majesty, look what I found. I have found a sign from Allah, a sign an ayah from Allah. Allah is showing us that our school of thought, our way is right and the Shia are wrong. It's a miracle. Look, it's a sign of Allah. The king says, what? He looks at the fruit, the pomegranate. He sees carved with the skin of the, of the pomegranate. So naturally carved, engraved. You know, the, the letters are bar barging out. It's like it's natural. Nobody did it. That's how it was made. What's written? La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali Khulafa Rasulullah. He says, see, this proves that our way is right and the Shia are wrong. So the king, he says, subhanAllah, this is a sign from Allah. Only a blind person would, you know, would, would not accept it. And then the, the, the prime minister, he tells the king, bring the Shia tomorrow. Bring the VIPs, the community leaders, and tell them, show them the sign, show them the miracle, and then give them an ultimatum. Get, tell them you have three options. Number one, you believe in this sign, in this miracle, and you all change your religion. Number two, if you don't want to believe, then you have to give a reply. Disprove that this is a miracle. Or number three, if you reject either one of these two, then I will kill. Tell them that I will kill all the men and take your woman as prisoners of war. The next day he brings all the, the, the important people from the Shia, come, he summons them to the palace, they come, he shows them the pomegranate, the fruit, and then he gives them the ultimatum. He says, I give you a week, you come back with a reply, if not, I kill all the men. They go back, they don't know what to do, they know that the prime minister is behind it, they know he's evil. But they don't know how to disprove it, they don't know how to convince the king that this is an evil plot of the prime minister. So they sit, they deliberate, they speak with each other. What should we do? They discuss every, every you know, point that someone brings, every solution. They say, no, the king isn't going to believe us. So in the end, one of them says, you know what? We have an imam, the 12th imam, the imam of our time. He's alive. He can hear us. Why don't we turn to him? Let's turn to him and tell him, Ya Sahib al-Zaman, adrikna. If you don't come to our rescue, there's no more Shia in Bahrain. Your followers will all be killed. They say, that's an excellent idea. They choose the three most pious mu'min people in Bahrain. Where they pray all the time. They have such a holy face. 
And they decide to send for three nights, consecutive nights. Each night they send one of them all by himself in the desert. All he does, he does dua. Tadarru'ah, khushu' ila Allah, tawassul. Ya Allah, ya sahib al-zaman. They do tawassul in sahib al-zaman. From Maghrib to Fajr, ask him to help us. The first night, the first one goes from Maghrib to Fajr, he's crying, Ya Sahib al-Zaman, Adrikna, help us. Nothing happens. The second night, they send the second one from Maghrib till Fajr, Ya Sahib al-Zaman, Adrikna. Nothing happens. Until the third night, they sent the best one, they saved the best for last. They sent a man by the name of Ash-Shaykh Muhammad ibn Isa al-Dimistani. If you go to Bahrain today, they've made a shrine over his grave. A shrine over his grave, people visit and ask hajat from him. That's how holy he was. So a Shaykh Muhammad ibn Isa al Dimistani, he goes, he cries and cries the whole night. Ya Sahib al Zaman, you know what's happening to us. We have no one to turn to. Please rescue us. Please save us. Adrikna, madadi, madadi. It was before Fajr. All of a sudden, when he's doing dua, he hears someone walking from behind him. He comes to him and he calls him by his name. He tells him, Oh Muhammad ibn Isa, what do you want? What are you doing here? Muhammad ibn Isa, because he's so in the dua and crying, he tells him, he doesn't even look at him, he tells him, I am crying, you know, for my Imam, I have a hajjah, I'm asking my Imam for a hajjah. So that man asks him, Oh Muhammad, I am the messenger of your Imam. The Imam has sent me. Now some reports say it was the Imam himself that came and show, showed up. Other reports say that it was the messenger, one of those 30 companions that I spoke about of the Imam. He said, I am the messenger of the Imam or I am the Imam himself. Tell me what you need. Now Muhammad ibn Isa is smart. You know what he told him? He told him, if you truly are the Mahdi or the messenger of the Mahdi, you know what I want. I don't have to tell you, right? So right away he told him, yes. I know what happened to you people of Bahrain and the evil plot of the Prime Minister and he's given you an ultimatum and if not he will kill you soon. And then he told him, oh Muhammad I have the solution for you, I have not neglected you, I have not forsaken you. He tells him, what is it? Because now he knew, that he knew, he knew his intentions, so obviously it must be the Imam or his messenger. He told them, tomorrow go to the king and tell him that we have a reply to this miracle, so-called miracle, it's not a miracle. But tell him first, in order for us to show you how this is not a miracle, it's a game, it's an evil plot, tell him, come to the house of the Prime Minister, we will answer you there. The Imam tells Muhammad ibn Isa, the Prime Minister will be there, he will try to discourage the king, no, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't have to go you know, to our house, let them uh, just say it here. But please insist, insist on the king. Let's go to the house of the prime minister. We'll give you the answer there. The king is gonna accept. Once you go to the house of the prime minister, go in this specific room. He gives them the instructions. Once again, the prime minister will try to prevent you. Insist, the king will allow you. When you go in this specific room, you will see there is a cover on the wall. Remove that cover, you'll see a hole in the wall. SubhanAllah. Place your hand in the hole, you will see a mold made out of clay. Inside that mold, those words are written, are carved. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, all the other words that were on the pomegranate. Tell the king that the prime minister took this mold made out of clay and he placed it on a pomegranate, small pomegranate on the tree when it was growing. He put it around it, the pomegranate as it grew because it was carved with those words. This is how you got those letters. It's all a game, he did it. And then tell the king to increase his conviction that this is ghayb, ilm al ghayb from an imam, you know? Tell him that inside open the fruit, there is no fruit inside it. Open it and you will find ash in it. How would someone know that? If he does not have direct access to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now Muhammad ibn Isa al-Dimistani is so happy. He goes back to the Shia, he tells them, I saw the Imam or the messenger of the Imam, he gave me the solution, he's so happy, they all rejoice. The next day they go to the king, they do exactly as the Imam ordered them. They go to the king, your highness, we have a reply, we can disprove that this is not a miracle. 
He says, how? They tell him we have to go to the house of the prime minister. The prime minister says, no, this is they're trying to play games, waste time. They insist on the king. He says, it's okay, let's go to the house. They go to the house of the prime minister. They say, we have to go in this specific room. He says, no, because he knows he'll be exposed. They go inside that room. They go, they place their hands and they show him that mold. They give it to the king and they explain to him, this is how it happened. It's the work of the prime minister. He surrounded, he placed it around the, around the pomegranate. When it was small, as it grew, those words got carved. The king says, subhanallah, it makes sense now. And he was deeply angered at the prime minister because he fooled him. And then he asked them, the king asked them, how do you know this? Who told you this? This is a miracle. This is the miracle. Not the pomegranate. They told him, we have an imam, his name is Al-Mahdi, and he never neglects us. We went, we did tadarru' to the imam, we did tawassul in the imam, and the imam informed us, and then they tell him, to increase your conviction that he is a true imam, he told us that open it, there is no fruit inside it, there is only ash. The king opens it, he says, it's all ash. He says, subhanallah, and this is when he says, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, aliyun waliullah, the reports say that he changed his school of thought and he ordered his prime minister to be executed because this was a form of treason. This was a form of betraying him. He was fooling him. He was lying to him. The Imam beautifully came to the rescue of these people. Brothers and sisters, remember any time that you're in desperation, any time you're in need, any time we are in a dire condition, we have an Imam that hears us, that helps us. Turn to him, say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, adrikni. If you're sick, say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, adrikni. If you are feeling depressed, say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, adrikni. If you are in debt and you need help, say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, adrikni. He's the door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we forget about him when we have a problem, when we are desperate. Remember, go to the Imam. Wallahi, he will give you what you want. Try it. Try it and you'll see the Imam will not let you down because the Imam is the door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many beautiful stories I have heard of people that turned to Sahib al-Zaman and Sahib al-Zaman did not let them down. And that's why I want to read for you tonight, brothers and sisters. Let us all read together. <coughs> Read with me. Haba Saleh El Tema Sedra Har Kujarafti Yah Demaham Bosh. Everyone, Hamabaham began. Haba Saleh Yah Haba Saleh. Ya Aba Saleh Ya Aba Saleh Ham Abu Ham Aba Saleh Ya Aba Saleh Ya Aba Saleh Aba Saleh El Tema Aba Saleh Ya Ya Aba Saleh Aba Saleh Ya Aba Saleh Madine Hey. 
از کوچه ها رفتی یاد ما هم باش همه با هم عبا صالح یا شب جمعه کربلا رفتی یاد ما هم کن عبا صالح یا عبا صالح یا عبا صالح یا عبا صالح هرچی حاجت داشتی امجب امشب توسل کن به صاحب زمان به عبا صالح امام زمان حاجت ما را به ما میده ما را فراموش نمی کنه ترک نمی کنه یا صاحب زمان ادرکنی ادرکنی الان بریم به کربلای معلا شب یازده همه محرم بی بی زینب از خیمه خارج شد دنبال یه چیزی بود دنبال بدن ابی عبدالله بود اما چجوری این بدن را بشناسه وقتی بی سر افتاده روی خاک کربلا چی میگه بی بی زینب آی امام حسین چی میگه گلی گم کرده ام می جویم او را اگر حفظ هستید با من بخونید گلی گم کرده ام می جویم او را به هر گل می نشانی در بدن داشت یکی پیراهن کهنه به تن داشت اگر پیدا کنم زیبا گلم را به آب همه بگن آه یا زینب 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 It was the 11th day of Al-Muharram Umar ibn Sa'd ordered that all the women, all the orphans with Imam Zayn al-Abideen have to leave Karbala and head to Al-Kufa. He ordered the men that all of them have to ride on the camels. Zainab السلام, would help everyone ride the camels until only she and Umm Kulthum, her sister, remained. Zainab told Umm Kulthum, my sister, let me help you mount the camel. Umm Kulthum said, if you do that, you will be all alone. Who will help you mount the camel? Zainab السلام, turned towards the Euphrates. She said, I will turn to my brother Abbas. I will ask my brother Abbas to help me. نالزد ای برادرم امباز مگه تو قول ندادی از من حفاظت کنی مگه نگفتی خواهرم زینب تنها نمیمونی 
کجایی الان ای برادر همه بگن آه یا زینب آه یا زینب آه یا زینب عمر بن سعد then ordered he ordered the enemies he told them that when you take the women on the camels out of Karbala make sure that you take them through the bodies of the shuhada so they see the bodies of the shuhada to crush their hearts he wanted them to see the beheaded bodies one more time when Bibi Zainab السلام, was going through the bodies, she was looking for the body of her brother Hussein. When she came across the body, now I ask you, how did she find the body of Hussein? It had no head. She was looking for the body that had the most wounds, that had the most injuries, that was the body of Hussein. When she came to the body of Hussein, she cried out, Ya Jaddah, Ya Rasulallah, Ya Muhammadah, Hada Husseinuka fil ara, Masloob al-imamati wal-rida, Mahzuz al-raisi min al-qafa, Ya Rasulallah, look at your grandson Hussein, They have beheaded his body, he is laying on the sands of Karbala. And we are your daughters. We have been taken as prisoners of war. Ya Rasulullah, look at what they have done to us. And then she looked at the body of Hussein. She said these heartbreaking words. She told her brother Hussein, Akhi Aba Abdullah, Law Khayyar to Bain al Rahil, Wal Mukam Yandak, Lachter to Al Mukam Yandak, Walaw Al Siba. She told him, my dear brother Hussein, I swear if they gave me the option to stay here by your body, by your grave, I will stay forever. Even if it meant that the predators, the lions, the animals would eat my body. But they are forcing me to leave you, Ya Aba Abdullah. نمیشنوم همه بگن آه یا زینب چند دقیقه سینه زنی یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین مثل من منو نگاه کنید اینجوری سینه بزنید یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین همه بگن یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین از حرم تا قتل گه زینب صدا می زد حسین از حرم تا قتل گه زینب صدا می زد حسین از عطش در زیر خل جر دست و پا می زد حسین یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین همه بگن جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین از حرم تا قتل گه زینم به دنبالت دوید 
از حرم تا قتل گه زینم به دنبالت دوید از اتش در زیر خن جردست و پا میزد حسین یا حسین همه بگم یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین از جنان تا قتل گه زهرا صدا می زد حسین از جنان تا قتل گه هی در صدا می زد حسین از جنان تا قتل گه زهرا صدا می زد حسین از جنان تا قتل گه ای در صدا می زد حسین یا حسین جانم حسین چمره بی اصل و حیا گر صدای من گرفت تن و همی خانم برات از حرم تا قتل گه زینب صدا می زد حسین از اتش در زیر خن جر دست و پا می زد حسین همه یا حسین جانم حسین یا یا حسین جانم حسین یا حسین جانم حسین نسألك اللهم و بسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرام هم ما هم ده بار بجن يا الله يا الله يا الله يا ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة الحسين وفي الآخرة شفاعة الحسين اللهم عجل لوليك صاحب الزمان العجل والفرج اجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم اقضي حوائجنا يسر أمورنا اشف مرضانا اقضي ديوننا وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما إلى روح آية الله ساجدي نبعث ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلوات